afternoon, Dennis Madden. Carl Hi. Hackert here from Proctor's Theater. We've known each other since, well, 1979. Started calling you up when they were first announced about the saving of Proctor's Theater, and your name was in all the papers. Yeah, we actually uh, took possession in Jan in uh, 79, but we had started, uh, I believe, in 77 or 76, right after the bicentennial. That's when we started working with the Schenectady Arts Council uh, and its executive director, Irma Hamilton, who was also on the Proctor's board. Mm -hmm. yep. And at that time, when I would call you up and bother you uh, about saying that they needed an organ at Proctor's, you were working at the National Bank at Scotia and uh, doing this stuff all as a volunteer and forming the uh, Arts Center Theater of Schenectady? Right. After the, uh, again, I mentioned the bicentennial. After the bicentennial, um, where I was very active, uh, Kay Rosendahl, who uh, was on the board of directors here at Proctor's, uh, asked if I would join. They'd make me vice president of the board with Marty Moore. So there were two vice presidents. And uh, I didn't need any inducement. I really wanted to. I wanted to work at Proctor's. And so uh, First National had me working at the Erie Boulevard branch of, of the bank, and I would wander up here every, uh, oh, every day. I'd spend my noon hour up here climbing on the scaffolding that was in the theater, talking to the cedar workers who Schenectady uh, City Council provided, and we did, we painted the theater, we cleaned it up, and we got ready for opening night. And there were roof leaks and... Uh everything that you could imagine. Yeah, I always tell the story, uh, t to me, the, the story that really says what Proctor's Theater was, and that is an opening night with a full house, a truly sold out house with Harry Blackstone Jr. We opened the doors, we filled every seat, and within moments, every toilet in Proctor's broke in the on position. Uh, every valve broke, water started going down our aisles. Women were walking around in their high heels in about two inches of sewage water. And uh, that's how Proctor's got its rebirth, <laughs> baptized. They, that, they thought that was part of the magic show. Huh? Yeah, and again, as a volunteer, I was in charge of the facilities committee. So in a three-piece suit, I strapped on a work belt and we went down in the basement and trace the sewage line and put a, a wrench around it, opened it up, and with that, the explosion occurred of sewage as it came pouring out of the six inch line and all over the basement <laughs> of Proctor's. So I, I smelled as good as possible that night too. I bet. I, and the audience, Stayed. You know, the audience stayed, and Harry Blackstone Jr., maybe it was just because it was new to all of us, you know, the fact that we didn't have live entertainment with any frequency. We had the ballet and orchestra at SPAC. We had the colony summer tent, but this kind of stuff didn't happen in the area. Harry was just brilliant, and it was, I mean, I still to this day, I can tell you what he did. He made this light bulb float around the theater, which to me, a regular lit light bulb just floated out and over the audience. Uh, he brought an elephant on the stage. He made an elephant appear on Proctor's stage. <laughs> so, I mean, that was, that was unique. But even crazier than that, when the show ended and everybody loved it, we were sure we'd done the right thing to get this reopened. Uh, earlier in the evening, Frank Ducey gave... Um, or was given a $1 from Kay Rosendahl and that uh, got the theater uh, in our possession. We bought it for $1 overpriced at that. And uh, so a great evening. Now, just, uh, and I'll make this quick. The elephant was loaded on the truck with all the other animals. There were, you know, lions, tigers, and bears and an elephant. And it was moved over to Union Street in front of the Van Dyke because we, the, the board went there with Harry and company for a little celebration after the show. That night, the elephant was taken out of the truck and had to push the truck down Union Street because of the snow. 
So anybody exiting the Van Dyke that night probably thought they were looped. <laughs> Well, we have some guests here who are all remembering these days. They're they're behind the camera. Uh -huh. and, uh, it's um, your your role then was as a volunteer initially, and then uh, yeah. they talked about acquiring the organ and putting a first class sound system in the theater. No, I, I wish that was the case. Um, we needed a sound system. We found that. Broadway shows would not use the theater sound, that they insisted on using their own, and that meant that we had what I would say is poor sound for almost every early show. It was not sharp, it was uh, not divided into areas like the balcony, the lower level under the balcony, the uh, box seats, had no uh, special sound at all, but that which was loaded off the truck when a Broadway show came by. So that was a problem. And the organ, which we're really here to talk about, you might you mentioned it. I know you did, and I know you love it, and I know we had several people that loved it, and many of which were volunteers with the Stage Electrics. They would go down there and they'd help us with getting, getting lights to come back online after they weren't working anymore. But where the organ really came in was um, we had a group called the League of Historic American Theaters. Mm -hmm. And that was a group of uh, theater executive directors that got together every summer and took a, a tour of uh, a region of the country. Um, I believe it was 1980, we went to Ohio and we saw what was the, the called the Beautiful Ohio in Columbus. Yes. And That's at that theater was Alan, or excuse me, was... Uh, Dennis James. Dennis James. And it was magical. Uh, they said, tonight, please come to the theater early because it always sells out. And we were all just, this is crazy. The theater's not going to sell out. This is an organ show. And we uh, ate our words because we went to a full house, uh, the theater lights dimmed, the organ, uh, before it came out of the pit, they showed a little black and white film of a man putting on his straw hat, checking his tie, and jacket, getting in a jalopy, a turn of the century uh, Model T Ford, driving down the streets of Columbus to the theater. And when it got to the theater, the back door is open, and Dennis James came strolling down in that same outfit, went down in the orchestra pit, and came rising up to beautiful Ohio. Mm -hmm. And it was spectacular. The whole evening was spectacular. And when I left the theater, I said, Dan, we're going to have an organ at Proctor's. And I already knew who to talk to. <laughs> and, uh, and that was the the start, I think. Well, Dennis James was also known as probably the preeminent uh, silent film artist of that time. He was true. And uh, he was at degrees both as a classical organist and as a um, theater organist. Yeah. And he was very methodical and very thorough having done shows with him. It was all business. It was perfect. When he plays a silent film, it is perfect yeah. in time, yeah. completely scored. And uh, his professionalism, I recall at the dedication, he had... I remember reading, meeting him in 68 at the first, uh, one of the first American Theater Organ Society conventions mm -hmm. in New York City, and Alan Mills was playing at that convention. He heard Alan Mills, and they were struck up an instant friendship because they both had the same classical background but gravitated towards the theater organ. When Dennis uh, was first at the theater that afternoon, we had been told, you probably told me, that Alan would be there that evening. And uh, Dennis and I talked and I said, please introduce me to Dennis and, or, or to Alan. And uh, he did better than that. He, I think he announced from the stage net that night yes. that uh, Alan was there. He embarrassed and, the heck out of Alan Mill. <laughs> and how pleased he, uh, he thought the theater ought to employ yeah. uh, Alan. He put in the Best plug I have ever heard anybody. He took a chance. No, that was great. That was wonderful. So uh, then you guys traveled a bit. 
I took you down to our company, Allen Organ Factory, because the question came up, well, why not? Why a pipe yeah, organ? Yeah. And we showed you the best that we had, and we all kind of concluded after we did that, that no one would come to the theater unless it was a real, authentic Wurlitzer I theater. loved the organ you showed me, and it was a, a, t a top quality yep. uh, piece of, of uh, equipment, and it would have been, you know, I, I think it would have been great to have it. However, when I heard that organ in the room in uh, St. Paul, and the the room shook when the organ played at full volume. That it was Goldie. really that was Goldie in yeah. its second home. Uh, Goldie's original home was in the Paramount Theater in Peoria, right? And it was built in 1931. Mm -hmm. And I have pictures of it. I showed you before when we were talking uh, that it was all gold, and that's where it got its right. name from. And then Claude Newman purchased it and built uh, Cedarhurst, I believe it was called. Yeah, he didn't build Cedarhurst because that had been a, a mansion in in St. Paul for a long, long time. He was proud to say how many presidents Cedarhurst had hosted, uh, and uh, he uh, invited us out there. We went to Cedarhurst, and by we, it was Alan uh, Plunkett. Alan Plunkett, Dr. Plunkett. And Dr. myself, Mother. and we sat with uh, Claude and took a full tour, and Alan sat, Alan Plunkett also plays the organ. He's not... Yes. Of Still the, playing the, out yeah, in Washington and, State. So yeah. he sat down and played it for a while, and Claude played the organ as well, and uh, we asked him the price. And I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, he said it's sixty-five or sixty-eight thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and we started negotiating. And I remember that very, very well as mm -hmm. well because we didn't get anywhere with Claude. Yeah. Claude said the price is sixty-eight thousand, and that's what it is. And I think he was planning for his own demise. I think he was elderly, and I think he was about to pass away. As I remember, he did shortly yes. after that and he uh wanted the true value of that organ to be part of the deal well and this, it was yeah and this is the guy uh, they probably can't get this but that's oh, goldie we'll and it's a black and white photo and that's all there was available but that is all gold and it was a much smaller stop list and when claude newman got it he expanded the stop list and he made it a much larger instrument so that what we actually see today in the theater is similar to this one, and that's Dennis James at the dedication mm -hmm. of, of, of Proctor's Goldie. And there you see it's white and gold, and it, yeah, that's when you saw it, and you said it'll fit in perfectly with the decor of the theater. You know what it fit in even better with? Fundraising. Yes. Because we have a very generous family in town, and we went to them and we spoke to Bill and Goldie, uh, and... Uh, those, that's the Golub family. Yes. And well, you they mentioned. eventually, uh, and it wasn't a hard sell. They came through and they they paid not only for the organ, but I believe they paid for some of the uh, installation fees and total finishing. It was well over a hundred thousand. Yes. Gave. Yeah. Um, there is a video I have brought, which we can splice into the video. I can get you the original CDs for the engineers here. But I'm going to let Dennis just take a peek at this because he helped produce this in 1986. Once upon a time, in a town called Schenectady, a treasure to hand down to our children almost was lost. Until it was saved by those who loved it. Proctor's Theatre and its magic voice Goldie casts its spell over the capital district. Goldie, the mighty Wurlitzer. Gift from Price Chopper brings music to our hearts. I wonder where that boy is today. <laughs> yeah, and, and the announcer that did that that famous commercial for you guys, it ran for several years. Uh -huh. Do you remember who she was? I don't. No. Beautiful English accent. She, no. I thought she was an actress and that uh, had to re retire here. Could have been. We uh, were very fortunate to get different actors to do commercials for us, and obviously... Hal Holbrook, uh, Hal Holbrook did uh, and, did several, yeah. and um, I remember he was one of the most loyal people that did the shows here. And those were the days when you had to hand count 
the registration, who, how many tickets you sold, and he didn't care. It, it, it was really amazing. It was. Uh, it was. It was terrific. And I came here as a tenant with you guys in uh, December of 82 with my brother Frank in our business, and we were downstairs just the way uh, F.F. Proctor envisioned the arcade as a way to generate some money. We had 27 uh, offices and uh, rented uh, 20 of them, many to Human Services Planning Council and others to yourself and uh, another uh, music store that was there forever, uh, now gone, but... Uh, and the original important. percussionist, yeah. do you recall, remember, Tony, he had the office up on the second floor by where the bathrooms were, yeah. and he yeah. taught, he played percussion in the original pit orchestra mm -hmm. here. And when I met him, he was 90-something, and he still would go to the, uh, the little deli that we had in the arcade. It was a lot of fun. I stayed here for nine, ten years before I had to move because yeah, our, of the our, changes. Our own stage deli, I guess. It was a lot of fun. Um, do you remember some of the people on the board? I, I have you, obviously, uh, as the staff people, not the board. Let me get to the board in a second. Dennis, obviously, you were the first employee. Uh, the first, uh, right? I was executive director. Uh, that, that was, again, followed by Ed B. Uh, his mom uh, ran Madison North, who was very uh, really important to our development. They raised uh, awareness of Proctors, and they actually got us our first audiences. We were really having trouble convincing the Capital District that they ought to come to Proctor's. And uh, Mary's, uh, Mary B's hard work uh, led to that. So Ed B, uh, Alan Bryce, uh, who was from uh, London and was uh, uh, quite a theater guy, Actor. wanted to uh, act, wanted to produce, wanted to direct. Uh, and he ended up in development uh, as well, raising money for us. Proctor's 2 also, the small. Thing. And he came up with the idea for Proctor's 2, which again was a small theater with uh, uh, 125 seats just down the street where the bakery is now, I believe. Is All I remember is when I left here, there were 72 employees and uh, some really terrific people. Uh, Kay Pagel was in finance. Uh, uh, I'm, we've mentioned Bob Warlock, but Bob did a lot of things. Bob did the films here. He decided which movies Proctor's should run during the summer. Uh, both, uh, we, we would have a blockbuster one night, a foreign film the next, a silent movie the next, and um, Bob kept it busy. And he made the popcorn too. He made the popcorn and sold the candy. Yeah. And uh, Bob was also in charge of seeing that the theater was kept clean and... Uh, Obviously, an he collected the job. rent. I knew about collected that. rent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he did collect. <laughs> um, Jackie Mosier. Jackie has passed away, but she was not only talented but sweet, wonderful. She produced the Christmas shows every year and uh, the organ shows that Alan uh, um, did. Jackie was our director for all of those. We did have, as you remember the off-Broadway babies. And uh, so the show became uh, a silent movie, uh, an organ recital, uh, the Rockettes from our our radio, radio City, our version, Orlando uh, Piggly Veno and his uh, wife and uh, we had the children's uh, choir. Yes, we and had, the brass group. Yeah. So this is a this was the recording that you made based on the, the that's an old record that didn't, I've had forever. Actually, Alan Mills gave me that one, and I've kept it. Um, but that's Alan with a Santa Claus hat on, and uh, the organ was turned around. It wasn't. Uh, it was quite a thing. We I remember doing that Christmas show. Alan and I used to change position at some point in the show, and he, I would sneak on the console. We were identical clothes, so people couldn't tell except my bald spot was bigger <laughs> than his. Um, but uh, we had to add a show, if you remember, to yeah. the Christmas show. We yeah. had to, we'd sold out three performances, yeah. and we just started to add another. We added a fourth. Uh, it typically would would be this, and, and I know how schlocky this sounds to I guess, but we would have um, one of the uh, part of the evening was a night before Christmas. And we would always find a local 
and I put that in parentheses, celebrity like Steve Fitz or uh, mm -hmm. Harry Downey. Harry uh, Downey. I'm trying to think some of the others. Don Weeks. Uh, Don Weeks, and they would uh, read A Night Before Christmas, and we'd always have to recruit some children, mm -hmm. Alan Bryce's children, my own kids were on stage for that, and uh, we would uh, uh, then go into the sing-along, which was just so much fun, except the night would end with uh, the uh, Hallelujah, Hallelujah Chorus, chorus. And, um, on the big screen. And although I love to sing, I would uh, be in charge of the projector, and I'd always screw it up. I don't <laughs> think I got through one evening. <laughs> but well, we it was, all you have to remember is hallelujah and you're in business. We recreated that when Alan made his return here uh -huh. and we did that again. And I have some old videos I'll let you see of how that worked. And so you were pretty good, actually. You got most of it. <laughs> now, Dottie just retired, I think. But she was the receptionist voice of Proctor's. I always remember her. She was another one that um, from the, the original group. Um, Jim Peterson, you hired Jim Peterson for current stage. I, we had great stage people that practically lived here, and I want to at least mention Mark Legier that uh, Mark spent Legier. Uh, 20 hours a day at the theater. And uh, yeah. Eileen. Eileen Eggleston and Tony Larson. Tony Larson. Yeah, she did makeup ones. and everything. Yeah. And she it, also went on the road with uh, Children of a Lesser God, too. When it left here, Tony was on the bus. She was here all night working. I remember having my office and looking there and saying, what is she up to now? But you guys all wore so many hats. And uh, it was Stan Hanna that eventually put in that first sound system. I remember being there and hearing a test. That did make quite a bit of an improvement for the movies. It did. And we started using the organ for the movies, playing it yeah. for a half hour or so. And that helped build up our audiences. You know, we had the, that Market Street Music Hall. At the same time this was going on, it had a Wurlitzer a three Emanuel 17 rank Wurlitzer, and that got a lot of people interested in theater organs. And so when Goldie came in, well, it was so it's so much better. Goldie sounded so much better because it was bigger, and it was in the real type of acoustics that it was supposed to be. But I will say, Marcus Street Music Hall in Ned Spain, who's one of our organists, was one of the owners. That really helped us a lot to promote the organ and to get the volunteers that were needed to install it. It did. I, I hesitate to bring this up, but it's uh, it was one of the interesting days at the Oregon. I hope all of you remember it. We brought in, was it Bob Ralston? Yes. From the Lawrence Welk Show. First of all, I have to tell you, he was a great uh, artist. He did a lot of great things on that stage, including playing upside down, which yes. I'm sure he, no did. One. he uh, <laughs> laid down on the piano bench and he played reversed. upside down. But Bob came with some baggage, and the baggage included the uh, Schenectady uh, police force who yes. followed him around town for three years, or three days, excuse me. And uh, nothing bad happened here at Proctor's. Nothing bad happened to Bob Ralston when he was in town, but it was an interesting weekend. When we opened the door for the theater, for the uh, concert when Bob was here, we had a line that took 90 minutes to reach the end. It extended out the arcade, through the big parking lot in the in the back, all the way to Broadway. And uh, it was an amazing, uh, we had something like 735 people show up the day of the performance for he tickets. Was quite a musician. Yeah. He was Lawrence Welk's arrangers yeah. as well. And uh, yeah. um, he, he gave us a lot of credibility, and he came back again mm -hmm. one, after you had left. Uh, he came back and did one more show, and he drew almost 2,000 people. Wow. You know, but the, the Lawrence Welk show has not been on reruns in a long time, so yeah. I think people have kind of forgotten. He did all those scores from memory. He had a photographic memory. It was very easy. He even played live with a video, if you remember, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which he, that was figured out at 2 o'clock in the morning with a videotape. He said, I can remember that score, and he played along. Amazing. Uh, now, some of these people that, you mentioned Marty Moore, is on, on your board. Um, uh, Karen Johnson was one of your big... Um, if I just, I'm gonna mention Karen, and please remind me if I don't, but it started uh, uh, Bob Larson, Robert Larson. He was the president of Schenectady Community College. He was the first uh, one that I remember as president of the board, uh, Kay Rosendahl, who is, in my mind, the 
finest lady that ever lived in in Schenectady County. Dr. Rosendahl's wife, Kay, was also Governor Scranton's sister. Mm -hmm. And uh, she donated constantly. If ever I needed anything, I'd ask Kay, and Kay would write a check for it. Um, so those are a couple. Mel Mintz, who ran Time Center Jewelers, was on the original key board uh, that uh, started here. And uh, uh, other officers, again, Marty Moore, who became supervisor of Niskiuna, um, uh, town supervisor. Marty constantly was here. Jim Lamell. Jim Lamell did the electrics backstage and kept those running for years and years and, and years. Um, and uh, Mayor Ducey, of course, was very supportive um, and his successors. Frank uh, was very helpful in the very beginning when they devoted a lot of, you know, that was the key moment for Proctor's. It could have been torn down. But uh, the council decided they wanted to save the theater. And... Today, that's a common story. You can find a historic theater in dozens and dozens of old American cities. But then it was not a common story. People tore down theaters. Look at the Plaza Theater. It became a parking lot for, so I think it was one of the first theaters that the city lost. And it was also its newest it was at only that 25 time. 25 years old. So Frank's uh, devotion at that time was very important. In the long run, Karen Johnson, another mayor of Schenectady, truly, I think, was one of the key people. She, she uh, dealt with people and she raised uh, money for proctors for years and years and also just was a fine person. Now, I was looking at the, the new Harry Apkarian came along, was coming on, on the on outside there, and you had done some fundraising and oh, yeah. the Walk of Fame and all that stuff. Now, uh, actually, the, the Walk States. of Fame came after me. What I can say uh, about Harry is when he became president of the board, he devoted a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of influence that Proctor's never had before that. He was key to the uh, long-term health and safety of the theater. Getting a, the board yep. to give some, fork over some money. Right. Because what good is a board if they're not willing to put their money where their mouths are? You know, when Proctor's first board came, they were a bunch of folks who could give you tons of time. They uh, swept the arcade, they mopped floors, they uh, went out and scrounged furniture for the dressing rooms, they, they did everything. However, a theater reaches a certain point where the most important thing a board can do is not mop floors, but raise money. And the fact is, at one point, uh, near when I was uh, left Proctor's, we had raised something like 97% of our income from earned sources and only 3% from contributed sources. Our budget was about $4.7 million uh, in, in later years, in the first 10 years. And uh, again, that was through sales of tickets. And, they and were our most popular reasonable. show... Was the organ? We never had a Christmas show that didn't sell out. And we added performances, as you mentioned. Yeah. Well, we and did, yeah, uh, we, we might have had bigger audiences for a week of uh, Chorus Line or Annie or 42nd Street or I could name a dozen others, but the organ show uh, was always profitable. And we built that set. Yeah. Everything was made here. And yeah. the stage crew worked their tails off they and did. the rehearsals would be 24 hour rehearsals. Yeah. And uh, Alan was diabetic as most people know and yeah. was very sick all, most of the time. And the stress on him physically was quite remarkable, yeah. but he also did the Easter show. I remember doing the Halloween show. We did uh, oh. a show each month, and uh, occasionally, I bet there were no more than 10 in the year, but add the extra Christmas performances, right. and you can see we got a lot of value from our employing Alan. As the artist in residence. Yeah. And did two to, we did two to four regular pure organ concerts, he was advising you guys on yeah. artistic matters, yeah. on educational matters. Oh, what a voice. He had a great voice. Yeah. He was just a natural on stage. I got to tell you, my favorite moment with the organ, nobody else was there but me. 
and uh, and I'm bragging about it, not anything else. Uh, we had a wonderful pianist come to Proctor's, and his name was Leon Bates. Yes. He came as a replacement for Andre Watts. Watts had been ill, had been in Colorado, and was afraid to fly here with an ear injury that he had. So we called up, got uh, Leon Bates here, and, and Leon was incredible. But what made it even better was Leon was practicing at the piano, and I said to him, you know, our, our artist in residence is here, and he plays a Rhapsody in Blue. Would you play that with him? And he said, sure. And he sat down at the concert grand, played the, um, the, the uh, pianist for uh, Rhapsody in Blue, and Alan played the entire orchestra behind him, both without music. Unrehearsed. <laughs> and unrehearsed, and I was alone in the theater. Wow. Well, um, this then I remember the dedication that Alan did. Alan's premiere here was mm -hmm. the Schenectady Symphony, and we did use the organ a few times with them, and we did it recently with the Albany Symphony. That's great. Um, that was also in the Saint-Saëns Organ Symphony. Uh -huh. And we met, if you recall, we added the MIDI stuff to it when you were here. We yeah. started expanding uh -huh. it, and uh, so it could access synthesizers. The silent films, the sing-alongs, the debut of an upstate New York of the Andrew Lloyd Webber Requiem. That was, was a, I sang in that chorus, and we had an incredibly uh, beautiful evening. A bunch of Mohawk Valley chorus and other uh, local choruses all participated that night, and it was great. And it was orchestra. really good. Yeah, it was a yeah. great performance. Uh, we did rec the recordings here, the Christmas record. With, there was uh -huh. another recording. I don't have a copy of it with me today. Uh, the tours, that were an interesting thing. That helped get a lot of... Uh, people coming into the theater sure. when it wasn't a show. And uh, Alan kind of turned some of those things over to us, N Ned Spang mm -hmm. primarily, Gene Zilka. Mm -hmm. The noontime programs started developing, which are continuing to this day, which feature all volunteers. Yeah, that's wonderful. But, but you know, this this whole thing wouldn't have happened had there not been a bunch of dedicated technical people to install oh. the organ. And, I, you know, when you got this tractor trailer pull up, full of organ parts. You tell me Did if you I'm wrong. suicidal? Or? I thought there was more than one tractor trailer. If you were here, you remember, I think we had to have two. It may have been two. And uh, to remember. have that pull up to the theater and have nothing but uh, skilled, smart people that love the organ here to put it together again. It was like, you know, they can't do this. If you remember, Several of the 16-foot pipes had been sliced in half mitered. and mitered for the basement at Cedarhurst. So, I mean, you had a lot of cool things to do and uh, get it ready for uh, Alan Miller. Yeah. yeah. And then Alan Miller came in. But uh, that, you mentioned Alan Plunkett. There was uh, Dr. Sandy Murdoch. Do you remember Dr. Yep, Sandy Murdoch? Yeah, I sure do. Paul Mahoney from Mahoney Hardware. A terrifically hard worker. Uh, Gus Pratt, who stayed on, and he's he's passed away. I know all those names. John yeah. Wiesner, who still yep. plays here, yep. and electro electronics guy. Harold Russell, who died last year, um, about a year and a half ago. Leonard Carlson, who's in his 90s, but he still tunes organs. And I have, I, I, this is a picture I have of, this is, that's Alan Plunkett in his engineering lab. <laughs> you remember that? And then this is Alan Miller, who is the premier tonal guy for pipe organs. He came over from Connecticut to work on this. And again, this was part of our 24 hours of operation because all of you remember a lot of this stuff, especially with the organ, could only be done at night. And Len Carlson, if we who was had a, a pipe show going brother. on or yeah. anything. I think he probably worked up there during film too, when yes. the movies were here. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it had to be hand wired. And John Van Lack, who yeah. is a wrote this Schenectady song, our Schenectady song. John just died two years ago. And John was on our board of directors as well, and I should have mentioned. That he before. really pushed the idea yeah. of the organ. Yeah. Um, very generous man and talented pianist. He could play the minute waltz in less than a minute. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there, I'm sure there are many other people that worked on the organ. Dedication was 1984 with Dennis James. We mentioned about Alan Mills. And uh, 
I was, think was that, Mitch Miller here that night or was that later? Oh, uh, that was later. Okay. That was later. I get those two confused because the organ was the star of that show as well. And Mitch was here to uh, be our conductor and director on stage for the audience. Uh, and we had, I believe, the Mohawk Valley Choir again for that evening. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, and, oh, and the show was opened with Maureen O'Sullivan. Jane from the Tarzan movies opened the performance that night with Joe Fava, the two of well, them. Well, you know, we've had some major theater organists come in. Uh -huh. Alan, Bur Alan knew them all, Lee Irwin, Ashley Miller, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Connections with some Ned Spain. In fact, yeah. they, they've yeah. they're old buddies. Uh, but yeah. some, some of the other top organists, Hector Oliveira, mm -hmm. has been here. And we, we'd love to see the, that type of artist come in. The, today, the theater is so busy, it's very difficult to schedule um, the full organ programs that we used to do. The artist in residence idea was really, I would, Mar Marty Moore really worked her tail off to get the funding and convince people that this was a going to be a good program. I know you supported mm -hmm. it, but it took a while to get it figured out what his duties would be. And um, Alan moved to California and he came back and did one more show. And then he died shortly after right. that show. Right. And we brought Tom Hazelton here. And you remember coming back I up do. for that show. And Tom Hazelton was also diabetic. I did not know that. And he was very sick when he did that show. And he died of complications from diabetes a year And later. by the way, Jackie... Mosier yes. also. Jackie passed away after Alan, but not, not all that long. No. Um, I have pictures which I can't remember. I think I showed all this, and I know it's a little difficult to do cheap pictures like this on TV. I do want to show you, this is our brochure from the Organ, organ Club today, and it lists all of our events that we do during the year, our meetings, our meetings and our noontime recitals. And we're saying that I'm, this year is 35 that's years. That's great. Since the since you got Goldie dedicated. So we're saying that this is the 35th birthday. Wow. Because it came here in 83 and it took a year to install it and was dedicated in 84. And our chapter uh, was founded, officially incorporated in 1985. Mm -hmm. Alan Mills was at the ATOS convention and picked, got the actual certificate. And so it's in 2020 will be 35. Wow. So we still have, in those days we had about 80 to 90 members of the, it was Capital District Organ mm -hmm. Society became the Hudson Mohawk ATOS. But we we are going to make you a chapter honorary, Dennis. Oh, man. great, thank you. And we are going to make you our volunteer, not just of the year, but our volunteer of the last 35 years. Well, you better save that with someone with <laughs> lots of money. You, you did everything that we could <laughs> possibly you. ask. Thank and you, it's just thank great you. to see you again. Yeah. And I want to thank uh, the people here um, for, at Proctor's uh, for arranging this interview. We were supposed to be down on the stage, but there's a lot of things happening. We'll take you downstairs and show you, get some pictures with you. Okay. With the organ. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>